Thank you, thank you very much. It is a great pleasure and an honor for me to be here today. Uh, uh, and I want to thank especially my good friend Alfredo Martinez for inviting me to give this presentation. So I'm going to speak about uh, cardiovascular risk and, and the intake of uh, red wine. So uh, it is funny that the logo of the University of Valladolid uh, means uva, that is grape in Spanish. So I'm going to speak about grapes and the fruit of, uh, and, and the juice of grapes, that is red wine. And also the color, the color is the, the, the color of red wine. I have no conflicts of interest whatsoever. So this is the outline that I'm going to follow. I will speak um, first about the current alcohol debate. There is a, a strong controversy currently. Uh, the consumption of red wine and some of its effects, um, especially on cardiovascular disease, but also on longevity and total mortality. Mediterranean diet, what happens to the Mediterranean diet if we remove wine from the definition of Mediterranean diet? And then I will introduce a new trial that we are con currently conducting from the University of Navarra. So starting with uh, the alcohol debate, all of you know this. This is uh, supported by, if you see this J, you think in the J-shaped association between alcohol consumption and total mortality or cardiovascular disease. So the lowest risk is for light to moderate intake. This is supported by more than 100 uh, epidemiologic studies. But now it is confronted by, especially, particularly by the Global Burden of Disease Study and also by the Mendelian randomization studies. So here, this is a, a very recent paper published in in Nature Communications. Uh, in the left panel, there are 27 case control studies. In the middle panel, 95 cohort studies. And in the right side of the slide, you see five Mendelian randomization studies. So in case control studies and in cohort studies, you see this J shape association with the nadir. The lowest point is 23 grams per day of alcohol. But there is no association whatsoever in the Mendelian randomization studies. The most important Mendelian randomization study is this one conducted from the University of Oxford. And it is conducted in the Kadori Biobank in China. So they built like six groups that worked only in males, not in females, according to two variables, uh, SNPs, so genetic information, and then uh, the combination of several genetic polymorphisms, and then geographic area. And they built six categories for uh, classifying alcohol intake, not according to cell-reported intake, but according to the genes and the geographical area. And they found that according to conventional cell-reported data, there was a U-shape association, but this was not present anymore when they look at the classification according to geographical area and genes. And even for, this was for coronary heart disease, but for stroke, the association was adverse, was harmful and linear. So this is confronted. But uh, for me, it is surprising that they present here the average consumption of alcohol according to these six categories in males, and you see, the monotonic upward trend, but these are the means. Where are the standard deviations? Where are the confidence intervals? They do not present a confidence interval because for sure there is a lot of overlapping among categories. So in, in epidemiology, we always present the means and the standard deviation or the standard error or the confidence intervals. So this could be a misclassified version of the true exposure to alcohol. So this is a problem with Mendelian randomization studies. And what about the global burden of disease? In 2018, in Lancet, they published this paper. This is a very long paper, but most people uh, only read the comment that was one and a half page, very easy to read. 
not the 21 pages of the original report. And the, the comment said, no level of alcohol consumption improves health. And this was the message broadcasted all over the world since 2018. Four years later, they published another paper, the same group with the Global Burden of Disease with updated data. And they said that uh, small amounts, uh, this is PowerPoint. PowerPoint always do something like this when you change from one computer to another. So uh, small amounts of alcohol consumption are associated with improved health outcomes in population that predominantly face a high burden of cardiovascular disease. So some small amounts of alcohol may do some benefit. According to the same group, you see the same group saying different things four years apart. So we have a strong controversy here. And the last report from the Global Burden of Disease defined two points. The theoretical minimum uh, risk exposure level, that is the, the amount of alcohol consumption that is associated with the lowest risk, even lower than for abstainers, and then the non-drinker equivalent, that is when they are matched, they are at the same level of risk, the non-drinkers and the moderate drinkers. So for Western Europe, if you look at, uh, at a woman of 60 years age, uh, the healthiest level of alcohol, according to the global burden of disease, is half a drink a day. So one drink every two days. This is the healthiest point. And even up to 1.2 drinks per day is the equivalent to non-drinkers. And it is even slightly higher for males. This is for Western Europe. So they only take into account the amount of alcohol, the geographical area, age, and sex, only four variables. But the global burden of disease of the, or the Mendelian randomization studies did not consider the drinking pattern, the drinking pattern. So I invite you to read this paper. I am the author of this paper. This was published last February in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So I presented a debate. Hmm? All the reasons to criticize the position of moderate drinking is the healthy option, the healthiest option, because you can forget the addictive power of alcohol. You can forget the sick quitter effect, the sick never started effect, residual confounding, all the problems of the conventional uh, epidemiology studies. So, and the conflict of interest of some researchers, that is always very important. But if you look at the other position, zero alcohol is the healthiest option. There are many reasons also for criticizing this position. Uh, mi the misclassified version of the real exposure, the unmet assumptions of the Mendelian randomization studies, the uh, smoking is not well controlled and smoking is associated with alcohol and some residual confounding by smoking may attenuate the benefits of moderate alcohol consumption. And so millions of deaths are at stake because 70% of the world population is drinking alcohol. And we don't have the highest quality evidence for the effects of alcohol. So we are in a very difficult position. So what about red wine specifically? going into deeper into the drinking pattern. What about red wine? So uh, this is a, a very large study recently published last year in the European Journal of Epidemiology by the Harvard group. So they compare in more than 40,000 people the association of the different types of alcoholic beverages with markers of disease, with biomarkers of disease. For uh, insulin sensitivity, coagulation, raising effects on HDL, the effects were the same for all kinds of alcoholic beverages. But for inflammatory biomarkers, after the nice and excellent and brilliant presentation by Philip Calder, I need to speak here of the inflammatory biomarkers. So I'm a little bit <laughs> ashamed. So, but you see, for CRP, and for interleukin-6, probably the most commonly measured biomarkers of inflammation, the effect of red wine was very powerful in comparison with other alcoholic beverages. So we have some uh, 
reasons of biological plausibility to support that red wine may be better than other sources of um, alcohol. And in fact, this very recent uh, review uh, found in 14 studies, are not presented here, benefits for cardiovascular disease re related to red wine consumption, but very importantly for total mortality and longevity. This is important because if red wine is giving benefits against cardiovascular disease, what is the balance when you also consider other potential competitive causes of death? So you need to look at total mortality. And you see once and again, red wine uh, is associated with reduced risk of all-cause mortality in the studies, in the prospective studies of large size that we have available now. And um, most importantly, this uh, study, including 27 estimates for uh, coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease in total, and cardiovascular mortality, uh, only out of the 27 estimates, only two of them were in the adverse direction and non-significant and many of them were statistically significant in the side of protection against cardiovascular disease. So we have this recent meta-analysis. The problem, what is the problem of this meta-analysis? That we don't have the size of the effect because the amount of wine was not available in many of the studies. So you don't know the dose response pattern. We defined uh, 10 years ago the Mediterranean alcohol drinking pattern. Hmm? And we published this in the British Journal of Nutrition with a system of scoring from zero to nine points. So this is the Mediterranean alcohol drinking pattern, uh, giving positive weights to moderation, to spreading the consumption of alcohol all over the week, not concentrating it in binge drinking during the the weekends, avoiding binge drinkings, consuming it with meals that is important to avoid the harmful local effect on the digestive system, the preference for wine, red wine, and the avoidance of liquors. So with this system from zero to nine point, this is the moderation according to Antonia Tricopolo. So keeping constant the amount of alcohol we saw a reduction, a significant reduction in total mortality as the a score of adherence to the Mediterranean alcohol drinking pattern was higher. So the higher the adherence to the Mediterranean alcohol drinking pattern, drinking with meals, uh, red wine, and so on, uh, the mortality was reduced within constant levels of total alcohol consumption. We published this 10 years ago. And then what happened? Uh, recently, in the UK Biobank, two studies in the UK Biobank, and another study in Italy, they replicated our findings. For example, in this study by Gianni, this is for total mortality, keeping constant the amount of alcohol. If you prefer red wine, the total mortality is reduced. And this is also present for the cardiovascular disease. This is for major cardiovascular disease. Also for consuming it with meals or spreading the consumption all over the week. So the drinking pattern is definitely very important. So what happened to the Mediterranean diet is we, if we remove wine, we have a first definition. This is the most frequently used definition of the Mediterranean diet by my good friends, Antonia and the late Dimitris Tricopoulos. They designed this zero to nine score of adherence to the Mediterranean diet, and they included alcohol as one of the nine points, and they found a substantial reduction in the risk of total mortality, cancer mortality, and cardiovascular mortality in association with two points out of nine points in this, in, in this Mediterranean diet score. And we replicated the, the findings in this systematic review of all the studies published subsequently uh, in circulation research in this paper. All these studies finding a protection of the Mediterranean diet against hard clinical events of cardiovascular disease. All of them are cohorts, prospective longitudinal studies. But we have also a field trial that is, uh, I thank all the previous speakers for mentioning PREDIMED. So uh, I was the senior author of PREDIMED. So we published this um, 
these results with this 0 to uh, 14 score that I will present, a reduction in cardiovascular disease with the Mediterranean diet that we uh, did an intervention. In the intervention, we designed this 14 item score for uh, upgrading the adherence to the Mediterranean diet every three months in our participants, 7,500 participants. And in two of the groups, we promoted the consumption of red wine, not inviting abstainers to start drinking, but keeping those who were drinkers at baseline to keep the uh, one glass of wine per day. So we found this. This is, has not been published. You are seeing this for the first time. So uh, in, in gray color, you have the incidence of cardiovascular disease during the PREDIMED trial without counting wine, with only 13 points, not counting wine. So people who did not meet the point of red wine. And what if we added red wine? You see that uh, the reduction in cardiovascular risk is even stronger when you add red wine to the other 13 items of the Mediterranean diet. So. Uh, what trials do we have? Do we have randomized trials of alcohol and cardiovascular disease or total mortality? We have very small trials. These are the th three largest trials on alcohol. Uh, Marfella did a trial in Italy in people with uh, patients with type 2 diabetes after a myocardial infarction, and they found in 115 patients after one year benef benefits of um, red wine in cardiac function and other biomarkers. In Israel, Idi Shai and colleagues conducted, this is the largest trial so far, with 224 after two years, uh, small benefits. All of them were non-drinkers at baseline. And recently, Bosco Boynik in Australia, in patients who underwent an ablation of atrial fibrillation or a, a spontaneous reversal of atrial fibrillation, they did a trial and they found better results for abstainers, for those who received the intervention to abstain from alcohol. So we have mixed results and very small trials. So we need a large trial of alcohol. We definitely need a large trial of alcohol. Let's think for a moment how many hundreds of millions of euros or dollars are spent in medication that will be eventually used by less than 1% of the population. And we don't have for conducting trials with medications. And we don't have such a trial with alcohol. This is amazing. This is a scandal. Hmm? So fortunately, last March, uh, one year ago, I received the good news that the European Research Council is going to fund this uh, is funding this trial, UNATI, University of Navarra Alumni Trialist Initiative. It is my pleasure to, to greet here, to say hello here to the former medical students who are here from the University of Navarra, because this is a trial conducted by former medical students, now medical doctors from the University of Navarra. This is a non-inferiority randomized trial testing advice of uh, moderate drinking versus abstention in uh, initial drinkers um, on major disease and mortality. So our goal is to recruit 10,000, not 224, that was the largest trial, but 10,000 drinkers from uh, 50 to 75 years, slightly older in women than men, drinkers of from three to 40 drinks per week. And with very wide uh, criteria of inclusion, very wide eligibility criteria, and all the intervention will be conducted um, by streaming online by coaches in two groups, one group of 5,000 uh, promoting abstention and another group of 5,000 promoting moderation according to the Mediterranean alcohol drinking pattern with the characteristics that I just mentioned. So, and the End point, the primary end point, will be a composite of all these events, total mortality, cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, dementia, depression, chronic liver disease, mainly cirrhosis, 
a major injury requiring hospitalization and major infection requiring hospitalization. So we, we uh, in our design, we expected to uh, have like 15 coordinators, each of them coordinating other nine medical doctors. In total, 150 medical doctors are tri as trialists. But in fact, we have recruited 33 coordinators, each of them with five to 25, 29 uh, medical doctors in their teams. So in total, we have more than 500 trialists now working in Spain. And uh, if each of them recruits 25 participants, we will have more than 10,000 participants. And we have hired with the funding from the ERC 15 coaches to give to deliver the intervention to participants with uh, personal interviews every three months and uh, group sessions every three months. So this is the the schedule for the collection of uh, information with a lot of questionnaires and a lot of interviews um, and the duration of the trial is four years. So we started the recruitment last May 15, so we have less than two months of recruiting. We have recruited now more than 500 participants, so we ha are now beyond the largest trial ever conducted on alcohol, and we will expand the recruitment up to the end of June 25. So we expect to recruit 10,000 participants in this um, 12, 14 months. So, um, uh, and we, we have trained the, the trialists and the, the coaches, and we are conducting mainly our procedures online taking advantage of all the expertise that we have acquired in PREDIMED and PREDIMED Plus. So thank you very much for your attention.